Hello to all our viewers, brothers and sisters there in Melbourne and from other churches there, Brisbane, Sydney. So glad to be a part of this camp. It's a privilege to share with you the word that the Lord has put on my heart. Am I, I want to start right away with uh, what God has put on my heart at this time for all of us, including myself. And uh, we go right to the beginning, in the beginning of the creation story. The Bible begins with these words, in the beginning, God. We've heard that many times, particularly recently. And there's more than just the story of creation here. If we stop and think and see what does God say to us from the beginning, we'll get a picture of God's plan for our lives, even if, we're, even if we are not all that we should be. Well, perhaps the devil for some of you has gotten somewhere as he did here and deceived and led astray, messed up the first two lives that God created in this Genesis story. So I want to read uh, from Genesis chapter one, just a few verses from there, Genesis chapter one, one to five. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and dark, darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning one day, a new beginning. We don't know what happened between verses one and two, but God did not create the earth empty and void and dark and with darkness. He created the, in the beginning, the earth was perfect. Like he always does, he creates everything perfect. But we know the story that between verses one and two, we know what period of time, the devil was thrown down to the earth when he rebelled against God, he wanted to be like God. And he was, no place was found for him in heaven. He was thrown down to the earth and we read that he came down to the earth with great wrath. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's like a army, like a ruler that uh, just wants to devastate and destroy everything because he knows that uh, he's going to be defeated. And that's how it works. And so that's how the earth became empty and dark and void. And uh, <clears throat> we see that's what he does with some lives when he gets place, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And uh, he can mess up a life real, real bad if, when he wants to. But there was one day when God said, let there be light. And this is what God wants to do in our lives. A new beginning was there when he began to recreate and restore uh, all that he had created so beautiful and perfect in the beginning. And I want to ask ourselves, has that one day come in our lives? Has there been that one day? It says there was evening and there was morning one day, a new beginning, when God said, let there be light. So we see so much 
here to the creation story that we can apply to our lives. As the creation story unfolds, we see the Holy Spirit. That's the next thing we see. In the beginning, God. And then the next thing we see that the Spirit of God moved over the surface, over the face of the waters. Everything was dark and empty. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters, over all that waste and emptiness and darkness and devastation which the enemy had caused over God's beautiful and perfect earth when he was thrown down from heaven because no place was found for him there. And he came down and wrecked everything that God had created. And that's what he does with human lives. But we see that as God always, this, he was always one step ahead or many steps ahead of the devil. And he had already planned his defeat right in the beginning. With his promise that the seed of the two creatures whose lives he had messed up and got them to, to doubt the love of God, that the seed that would come from them, that is Jesus Christ, would crush his head and he would only be able to bruise his heel. And <clears throat> that is what millions of Christians around the world focus on at this time. But it's just a mere ritual. It's just mere tradition. So has that one day come in our lives when God has said, let there be light, that we have got light? Or is it just more than one day, three more days when Jesus was buried and he rose again? And that's what many Christians around the world at this time celebrate. And, uh, and is it, or even a little more than that, like the disciples who, who saw him and saw his hands and his feet. And uh, yet they did not believe. Their hearts had become hardened. And that's what, that's the question I want that we ask ourselves. With all that we have heard in the church in all the years, have our hearts become hardened? I want to say this. The Lord wants to do much more than what we see in the Genesis story. Much, much more. He wants to bring beauty. He wants to bring the glo his glory into our lives. And he finished in Genesis, everything that he did was very good and he restored everything. But the Spirit of God still moves on. He's moving today and he will continue to move, not upon inanimate objects. Now he moves upon human lives. He moves upon those who are his new creation. That is you and me. Are we allowing him? Are we giving him room? Do we? Give him his proper place, his rightful place in our lives. That's what I ask many I come in touch with. Not that just we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but do we give him his rightful place in our lives? He is always moving and he moves in our lives, wanting to take full control, wanting us to open up every room, throw open every door, every window, so that the darkness will go from our lives and then we can, his glory can come in, light can come in and we can live lives. And as Jesus lived, we can walk as Jesus walked. So like I said, this is what is here in the Genesis story. I hope God will see that that's what he wants to do. He wants to bring everything to completion in, in, into our lives. He wants to give us light. He wants the Holy Spirit to have full control. And that is why the Holy Spirit was the third person of the Trinity. That's why he's here today. But do we give him his rightful place? 
Second Corinthians in chapter four, I'd like you to turn to that. These are lovely words. I, I, I read it often because there's so much here that we can see as to what God wants to do in your life and mine. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses uh, six to seven. says, God who said, listen carefully, God who said, in the beginning, light shall shine out of darkness. We just saw that in Genesis 1. Is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Stop there for a moment. Let's read scripture carefully. Let's read God's word carefully. Light shall shine out of the darkness like it did in the beginning. Is the one who has shone in our hearts, your hearts and minds, to give the light of not the knowledge of God, but the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. And we read in verses 3 and 4 there that the devil, like in the beginning, continues his work today, right? In the beginning, he deceived Adam and Eve, and he has not stopped working. He continues blinding the minds, it says in 2 Corinthians verses 4, and verse 4 I'm reading. He blinds the minds of the unbelieving. They might not see the light of the gospel, which is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I hope we got that. The light of the gospel is not just forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is a tiny part of the gospel. And even being baptized in the Holy Spirit is a little part of the gospel. But what the Holy Spirit is telling us here that the light of the gospel, the devil is out to blind believers and I also say unbelieving believers to the light of the gospel, which is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That is what the devil is after. He doesn't mind, you know, people coming to Christ. Of course, he opposes that. He doesn't mind you and me being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but he blinds the minds of the unbelieving. And unbelieving believers' minds are blinded by the devil that they don't see the light of the gospel. We read those words. God, who said light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> like one translation says, I like, I like what it says. It says he sets our heart ablaze to shed light on the knowledge of God's glory revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. He sets our hearts ablaze. If we open up our lives, like I was saying, we throw open every door, not just, you know, I, my sins are forgiven, not just that I read the Bible, I pray, not just that Yes, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, I have on a day and a date. But has he set your heart ablaze? Has he set my heart ablaze? I thank God I could say he has. To see the light of the, not the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that has changed my life over the last few years, particularly as I've seen more of that glory. I want to encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters who are listening to this word. Throw open, throw open those doors, that one room you got locked up. There's darkness there. Throw it open, throw open the windows, let the light shine in. And what will happen? It'll affect everything in our lives. It'll affect my desires. It'll affect my thoughts. It'll affect my dreams. 
It'll affect my attitudes. It'll affect the thoughts I have about myself. That I don't have high thoughts, that I'm not looking for the approval of men. It'll affect everything. Do we see that? But that is what, that when the glory of God comes in, there's no place for anything else. But we have given him a little bit of our lives. We have thrown, open up a few rooms. We have opened up a few do uh, doors. But there is, maybe there's one, one room there. And then you sometimes wonder, why? Why did I have that dream? Why did I have that uh, wrong attitude? I've cleansed my heart. I love people. I am living in victory over sin. I don't have impure thoughts. But something comes up. And then I see that there's something there in my heart, in my subconscious, that I need to let the Holy Spirit come in and shine. And uh, the light of God comes in, the glory of God comes in. And then everything gets affected when my my subconscious, the Holy Spirit takes control. We have a flesh, we have an old man, but the old man was crucified on the cross. So all I need to do is yield to God, to surrender to him. This is the message of the new covenant that we have heard in CFC for nearly 47 years. And what I'm speaking about, it's not something complicated. This is what he does, God doesn't just Want us to believe the new covenant, listen to messages, and thousands of messages are there. But what has it done? Have our hearts become hardened? So when God said, let there be light, and there was light, I want you to see it was not the light of the sun. We see that very clearly there, which God created on the fourth day. The sun was created, the sun and moon were created on the fourth day. What was that light? When God said, let there be light, it was a light of his glory that we just read in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. The light of his glory, the glory of God, lit up the darkness that the devil had caused. That's what he does with your life and mine. He lights up the darkness. He lit it. I know he did that for me 55 years ago. I trust he's done that for you. If not, I hope in this camp, you will open up your life you will let the light of God, that God can say, let there be light and light can come in. Then what he did in the Genesis story, he'll begin to do in your life. So the light that we see in the Genesis story is the light of God, the light of the glory of God, the light of the Lamb. We read that in Revelation chapter 21, 23. We don't have time. Look at it sometime. This is the light that's going to light up the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city that will come down from heaven. This is the light that's going to light up the new heaven and earth. You know, no need for the sun or the moon or, or any other external light. The glory of God is going to light up the new Jerusalem. The glory of God is going to light up the new heaven and earth. It says there that that uh, it, the illumination is the light of the Lamb from Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world. Is he only the light of the world now? No, he is going to light up his whole new creation when there's going to be a new heaven and earth. And that is what God wants to give us a taste of here in our earthly life, my brothers and sisters. I've seen this in my it's like those two disciples on the way to Emmaus, my heart is burned. I, I keep praying. And my prayer is not for anything material, not even, not even for some of the things that I see in my life. I know if the glory of God comes in, he will take care of all those spiritual needs in my life. I want to see the glory of God. God has shown in our hearts to give us a light of the knowledge of the glory of God, my dear brother and sister, in the face of Jesus Christ. Are we seeing that glory? Has that 
have I begun to see this that glory? It says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And as this, para, this paraphrase puts it, this beautiful treasure is contained in us cracked pots made of earth and clay so that the surpassing greatness of God is not from us, but will be will be of God and not from ourselves. The surpassing greatness of the power, this, the trans, transcendent character of this power, like this paraphrase says, will be seen clearly as coming from God and not from us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, like Gideon's three men, when they, when they broke their earthen pots, the light shone, blazed, and the enemies were scattered and defeated. That is why Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I pray that in this camp, that we will open ourselves more and more to the light of God, my brothers and sisters. The Spirit of God is moving in these last days. Everything is going to come to completion. The What God is doing in the church will come to completion. The top stone will be laid with shouts of grace, grace to it. In John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 5, we read similar words there. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness could not overpower it. So the Holy Spirit moves on as we see in Genesis 1, as he did over the earth. And as we open up to him, he separates all darkness from our lives. God cannot and he will not work in the darkness. As the Holy Spirit tells us through John, that men love the darkness because their deeds were evil. John chapter 3, you can turn there for a moment. John chapter 3 and verses 19 to 21 says, This is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And verse 19, it says, For everyone, verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as, as having been wrought in God. We need light upon ourselves constantly. And there should never be any darkness in us. Our whole body, God has promised, will become full of light. And uh, if we have the light of God in us, and upon us we will not stumble, John chapter 11, verse 10. So the Holy Spirit will continue to move in our lives if we let him opening up every, every area, every corner of our lives. So that, like I was saying just now, our whole body is full of light with no dark part in it. So God's work in our lives must continue. We must not come to a, a standstill. We must not stagnate. These are not days where we can sit still, relax, and uh, put our feet up and think, yeah, now that's it. I've done whatever I have to do. Well, there's much, much more that God wants to do in your life and mine as he has been showing me. And... Uh, and that work of God goes on in the church. In Ephesians 5, it says he wants to present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she should be holy and blameless. I hope we see it in Genesis, the Genesis story 
and then what we read in Second Corinthians chapter four, the God who shone in the darkness in the beginning is the one who shines in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. If you can go away from this camp, gripped with that, that is the message of the new covenant. If you've been listening carefully all, all the years, that is the message of the new covenant. It's not just forgiveness of sins and victory over sins. It's the glory of God coming into your life, your life and mine. So others see that glory and they are drawn to Jesus. And that glory must be reflected in our lives. It will show in our lives. Our countenance will be lifted up. You know, when, when Cain killed his brother, God, uh, God asked him, why is your countenance fallen? Why is your face fallen? So if I have a wrong attitude to somebody, my face is fallen, it's seen in my face. But like I said a little while ago, if I am opening up every area of my life, I judge myself rightly. I open up every day, Lord, take control here. I don't want to have a wrong attitude to somebody. I want my home to be a home of peace. I want to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I want to love my children. They go through different stages. I want to love them, accept them, not get tired of them. I open up my life, open up every room, and throw open every window, and let God, God's work continue. So, what is the sin that plagues our lives? What, what is it that keeps God and hinders God from doing what he has promised? And, you know, as this, the Spirit of God still moves today, as he did in the beginning, but sadly, there are two things that keep us from seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have to battle against these two sins and be freed and cleansed from these two evils that have plagued God's people and the church for generations. Two sins right from the beginning. I hope we see it and we begin to let God do something. We let, begin to let the Holy Spirit move and, and and bring us to a place where we are rid of these two sins that plague and hinder God's work in our lives. The first one is hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. Being in, what does that mean practically? Being insensitive, being indifferent. We get that from Jesus himself. You know, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, when the religious Pharisees persisted in getting an answer about divorce from him, and they said, why did Moses permit divorce? And uh, Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart. In the beginning, it was not so. That was not God's original plan. And many try to take refuge in Matthew 19.10 that Jesus made an exception there. But they don't take seriously what Jesus said because of the hardness of your heart. Moses permitted it. And because of your, your heart is hard, you want to put away your wife or put away your husband. You want a divorce. You're not bothered about the children. That's the sad condition of many believers' homes today. And that should not come, come creep into our CFC churches. And that's what we have to be alert and watchful. It's because of the hardness of heart. It's not listening to more messages. We have listened to thousands of messages through the years. But what is the result? Has it made our hearts hard? Or, or the opposite, we have become sensitive to God. We see that again in Mark chapter 6, verses 51 to 52. I want you to see it and to take it seriously. 
Mark chapter 6, verses 51 to 52. Jesus was walking on the sea towards these frightened disciples. <clears throat> there was a storm. And uh, he got into the boat with them. And the wind stopped. And they were utterly astonished. The, he, he rebuked the wind and the waves. And there was peace and there was calm. And they were utterly astonished. Astonished, really. And it says there, but the Holy Spirit says they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Jesus had done many miracles. They had not gained any insight. You know, that can happen, that we, we take it for granted. We... We are not thinking about miracles. We are not thinking of, of healing. But in all that God allows into our lives, we don't get insight. Because we have a hardened heart. And then again in Mark chapter 8, you read in verses 15 to 18, another incident. He was giving orders to them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. You know, hypocrisy. is warning them against hypocrisy. The leaven of Herod. What was the leaven of Herod? Herod enjoyed listening to John, fiery preacher. And he even wanted to see Jesus, but he was only interested in seeing a miracle. And he's warning them, be careful of this leaven, the leaven of hypocrisy, religiosity that can get into your lives, legalism. The leaven of Herod, that you hear fiery, powerful messages, but it doesn't soften your heart. And as we read there, it says they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Matthew 18, 8, verses 15 to 18, I'm reading. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves and we fed more than 5,000 people, how many baskets you picked up? When I broke the seven loaves and we fed more than 7,000 people, whatever it is, how many loaves? They had all the right answers. They had the right answers. And he, he said to them, do you not understand? Do you not understand? Do you not, do you not have insight? Has your heart become hardened? And that is why we read this, my dear brothers and sisters, five times in the New Testament, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Why does God say that? You can read up all those five, four or five times there. Today, if you hear his voice, today in this camp, if you hear his voice, not tomorrow, not the end of the camp, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. God is saying, listen, I want you to open up that area in your life that's been closed to me for so long. There's darkness there. I will change you. I'll change your attitude. I'll change your attitude to money. I'll take away your fear, your anxiety. Just let me in. Let my Holy Spirit in. And if we do that, my brothers and sisters, then we begin to see that God will soften our, our hearts. That's what he promised under the new covenant. I take out the stony heart from within you and put in you a heart of flesh. I'll give you a soft, tender heart. Your heart does not need to get hardened. That in a crisis, in a moment, in a difficult situation, you throw your hands up in despair and say, is God really with me? Why is this happening? What has happened? God is saying, open up that area. It's not trying 
to say, I'll do it better next time. No, there is an area in your life that you need to open up with God. The Spirit of God moves, as we read in the Genesis story, over the surface of the waters, over all the darkness and the chaos and the emptiness, and he brings light, and he will bring light into your whole life that will change, perhaps change the direction of your life. It will. I know as it did mine, as I did that many, many times through many crises, even recently. The second thing, the hardness of heart is the first thing. The second thing I want you to see is in Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Now Jesus is risen from the dead, but even after his resurrection, he had told them many times, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and be crucified. I will suffer and I will rise again. But they, they, they didn't take it seriously. So even after his resurrection, let's see this in Mark chapter 16, verse 14. He appeared to the 11 disciples as they were reclining at the table. And what did he reproach them for? He reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. Can you imagine that? He didn't reproach them for their lack of love, their lack of understanding. He reproached them, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. These are two sins that will take many unbelieving believers to hell. Hear this, my dear brothers and sisters. We ask to let the Holy Spirit deal with these two sins in our lives. And particularly when we go through difficulties, particularly when we face temptations and trials, particularly when we go through a crisis. Unbelief and hardness of heart. We have not gained insight from all that God has done in our lives through the years. And so many times, the devil blinds our eyes. And I pray that our eyes will be open in this camp, that we would begin to see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, that light will that light will shine in, into your heart, which shone through the darkness. The darkness cannot overpower that light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We go on from there. It says that even when they saw him, um, here it is. He, when they saw him after his resurrection, and they couldn't believe, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Those two disciples of going, <clears throat> walking on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus joined them, their, their, eyes, their eyes could not see Jesus because they're so bothered about the things that happened. Luke 24, you read that there. They're talking about the things. Have you not heard about the things that have happened? And Jesus, I like his sense of humor there. What things? What things? Oh, the things, and we go on reading that the things that have happened to Jesus of Nazareth, and we are hoping that it was he who was going to deliver us. And then Jesus said to them, Oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. There it is again, hardness of heart. They were reading what the prophets, they were listening what the prophets had said and written but their hearts were hard. And that's what can happen. That even hearing messages of the new covenant, my brothers and sisters, even for the last 47 years, our hearts can become hard. If we don't let the spirit of God move, move into our lives continuously. And so here when they're seeing him, not only risen, he's, he's going to be taken up in front of their eyes. Listen to this, Matthew 28, verse 17. They saw him being taken up from the, and they worshipped him. 
just before he ascended into heaven. Mind you, they worshipped him. He's, a, he's going up into heaven, into that cloud, and the angels are taking him. They saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Sad words. Imagine that. Seeing Jesus being taken in front of their eyes, and they're worshipping him. And we can do that. We think we're worshipping him. But we are doubtful. Doubt. Doubt is from unbelief. That we can worship and praise him and <clears throat> still have doubt, you know, is God really with me? So then what does the Holy Spirit call us to? <clears throat> what does the Holy Spirit want us to do about this? I want to share with you a few things. What God said through Jeremiah to a hardened people of God in his time. And I believe that this is what God is saying to us and to his church today. First thing, we want to get rid of hardness of heart. We want to get rid of unbelief. We don't justify ourselves. Four words God said through Jeremiah. Four words that he says to us as a church. Four words that he says to you and me. Only acknowledge your sin. And I see hardness of heart and I see unbelief as the greatest sins, worse than the worst sin you can call and name. I've said this through the years. I've seen this and I've sought to take it seriously. Hardness of heart and unbelief, they go together. Are worse than debauchery, worse than murder, worse than call it whatever you like, any other sin. Because these are the two sins that will take many unbelieving, believers to hell. These are the two sins that will cause many believers, many who have sat in CFC churches to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. The sad words. May it never be that we hear those words. Only acknowledge your sin, God said through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 3 verse 13. If you want to read it there, only acknowledge your sin of unfaithfulness and disobedience. Unfaithfulness and disobedience. And uh, you turn there for a moment. And God says there. In verse, uh, he says, my people have committed two evils. Verse 13 is what we just read. Only acknowledge your sin that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, scattered your favors to the strangers, so on. And uh, then he says there, my, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the living, the fountain of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that will hold no water. I've lost the reference there. Anyway, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Vinny. Jeremiah chapter 2. Yeah, that's what I was wanting to read. And go back there and, and look at verse 2. It says, go and proclaim in the years of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, 
I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness through a land not so. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvests, and all who ate of it became guilty. And uh, you can read on there. And then we read that those words. Uh, which verse is that, Vinay? My people have committed two evils against me. Yeah. Jeremiah 2, 13. 13, yeah. Thank you. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, evil number one. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. That's the first evil. The fountain of living waters. And the second evil, evil number two, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And that is what can happen to your life. We forsake the one who is the fountain of living waters, the one who cried out on the last day of that religious feast. With all the fervor, religious fervor that there was there in John chapter 7, verse 39. Come to me, all you who are thirsty, and I will give you to drink. He who believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That was the call, even at that time that Jesus made. And here, through Jeremiah, he says, my people have committed two evils. Evil number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And evil number two, they have hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What are, <clears throat> what are our cisterns, my brothers and sisters? Have we forsaken him, the fountain of living waters? Yeah, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We come to the meetings. We pray. We pray in tongues and all that. But how is my life? Is there freshness? And the scripture that Jesus referred to on that day in John chapter 7, verse 39 is Ezekiel 47. Where water up to the ankles and water up to the knees and water up to the waste and then enough water to swim in. That is how the, that is how God works. The Holy Spirit wants to carry you and me along, take my feet off the ground. I don't have to have a cistern of water that is leaking, that gets broken. Just allow the Spirit to carry, carry on, take me on. So have there been broken systems? It can be your job, your business. It's not broken yet. It's not leaking yet. Your ambitions, you've forsaken him, the fountain of living waters, your testimony in the church, that can be a system. It gets cracked and broken and leaks. Your ministry in the church, that can be a system. Instead of living before God, just being available to God, ministry, I find through all my years, 55 years, and many of my friends in full-time ministry, all they think about is ministry, ministry. What ministry? That is what many, many are concerned about. What can I do for the church? What can I do in the church? And when they leave in the church, they get offended and they say, oh, I sacrificed so much, I did this and then did that. A broken cistern that hold no water. The approval of men that can be another cistern. We love the approval of men more than the approval of God. That's a broken cistern. Instead of drinking from him, going to him, the fountain of living waters. These are the two evils that God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah's day that they had hewn out for themselves. Yet he invites them back. So even if our hearts are 
hardened and backslidden, he invites us back. He says, go and say what we just read in Jeremiah 2, 2. Go now and say this loud and clear for all Jerusalem to hear all the churches to hear. I remember the way you clung to me in your youth, the beginning in the early days of our union. Like a young bride, you loved the vows you made. I'm reading a paraphrase. As I led you from slavery in Egypt, your freedom in Canaan, and you drew close to me. How was it? I know I've been thinking of that recently. Going back to the beginning. How did I love him in the beginning? I had nothing of this world. I had no, no, uh, no reputation, no ministry in the church. I gave up everything. I loved him. That's what it says. You clung to me in your youth. How is it today, my dear brothers and sisters? And some of you young people there, that so quickly your hearts can become hard and cold. And so the Lord says to Jeremiah, return, O faithless sons and daughters. I am your master. I'll take you one from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion, bring you to the church of the living God. That's how much he loves us. And that in spite of our unbelief and hardness, he says, come back. I'll make your heart. Uh, make your heart soft. Come back. I'll put faith in your heart. And I, I'm your master. I'll take you from one from a city and two from a family, bring you to the church, put you to, in, to the church of the living God. The second thing that he asks us to do, and through Jeremiah, reading there again, he says, break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. One is only acknowledge your sin. The second thing, break up your fallow ground. That's what God asks us to do. Not by listening to more and more messages. Don't get me wrong here. It's good to listen to messages, but I can listen to a whole lot of messages and then my heart becomes hard. What do I need? I need to break up my fallow ground. I need to let the Holy Spirit come in and work and soften my heart. So the Lord says in Jeremiah 4, 3 and 4, that says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, let's put that to the church, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that has never been plowed. It has become hard. Yes, hearing and hearing and hearing, going to meetings, reading the Bible, praying, becomes a ritual. And he says here, do not sow among thorns. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Stop sowing among thorns. That is the desire of other things, the deceitfulness of riches that Jesus said creep in and choke the word. The Lord, the Lord is saying, blow up the hardness of your hearts. Break those clods. You know, ground that is fallow is ground that has not been plowed, become hard. So the Plow has to get into brick, and those clods have to be broken. So it becomes fit for sowing seed. And don't sow among thorns. Don't waste your good seed among thorns, he says, the living Bible says. And uh, that's what we need to do. Let the Lord plow our hearts. Take out the thorns, the desire for other things, the deceitfulness of riches creep in and choke the word and becomes unfruitful. And the third thing that the Lord asks us to do is there in Jeremiah verse 4, remove the foreskin of your heart that you become sensitive to the Spirit's voice. Remove the foreskin of your heart. Let it be a 360 degree cut, not just 180 or 200 degree, 360 degrees circumcision of the heart where my heart is sensitive to the Holy Spirit and that is what God calls us to do. Stop sowing among the thorns 
the deceitfulness of riches, like I was saying, the desire for what others have, whether it's a house or a car or something you, you see in their home. If you can afford it, if you don't have to get into debt, buy it, but don't covet it. And don't borrow just to uh, compete with others. So this is the call of the Holy Spirit, my brothers and sisters, through Jeremiah and Hosea, the same words that God says there, break up your fellow ground and don't sow among thorns. So let's remember that. But if I want to really be rid of unbelief and hardness that Jesus spoke so much about, I need to acknowledge my sin. Lord, my heart has become hard. In spite of all the years I've been in CFC, in spite of all the years I've been in the church, there's a hardness of heart, Lord. There are areas in my life that have not been opened to you. I want to open up those areas. Let the Spirit of God move in. Only acknowledge your sin, the Lord says. And <clears throat> that we don't faith, forsake him, the fountain of living waters. Come to him. Keep drinking from him. Wherever the river flows, we read in Ezekiel 47, there was freshness. There was life. That's how it must be in your life and my, my life. We know all that. We've heard all this in the church. My life has to be like the Garden of Eden. But I ask myself today, I, I ask you, is your life like the Garden of Eden? And if I'm drinking from the river, if I'm carried along by the river, then there must be freshness. Wherever the river flows, it reads in Ezekiel 47, read it sometime when you have time. There's, there's life, there's freshness, two things. And that's how it must be that when I go and visit somebody's home, I leave me behind life and freshness. Not that I leave, leave somebody's home and they, they, oh, they were just waiting for me to leave. That's how it must be in our lives. The glory of God comes in that wherever I go, there is life and freshness. I can bless others. And sometimes even without saying a word, just by sitting and listening, I can bless others. That is our calling, my brothers and sisters. And I believe the great need among us all is to only acknowledge our sin. Lord, my heart is hard. My heart has become callous, you know, corns that you get on your hands. Please help me. Take out the hardness, put in a heart of flesh. Help me to break up the fallow ground, the hardness of my heart. Help me to surrender myself completely, circumcise the foreskin of my heart, become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, the fourth thing that we are to do to keep ourselves, keep our heart from becoming hard. We've heard this word through the years in CFC, three of Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful like it was in the beginning. And it so quickly hardened the hearts of the first two beautiful creatures first two human beings that God created and brought disaster. Brought disaster not only on their lives, but on the whole human race. The deceitfulness of sin. We have to be alert to, to that. And the only way to encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. Thankfully, it is still called today, my dear brothers and sisters. And so we can encourage one another every day. Who are the ones we can encourage? My wife. She's not here. She's gone home to glory. But I can encourage my other family members and those who come to see me. So take that seriously. To say encouraging words to your wife. Say encouraging words to your husband. 
say encouraging words to your children so their hearts don't become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Finally, I just want to read this, this the words of this song that we sing many times. And I, I, I read it, I sing, and I weep when I read it. Search me, O God, my actions try. Let my life appear as seen by thine all searching eye to mine my ways make clear. Search all my sense and know my heart, who only can make known, and let the deep, the hidden part to me be fully shown. And this is the words I want you to listen to carefully. I pray this prayer often, throw light into the darkened cells where passion reigns within. Things that come up in a moment of provocation, in a moment of temptation. Light needs to come into, it's not, it's not yoga, it's not controlling myself. I need light in those darkened cells where passion reigns within. Quicken my conscience till it feels the loathsomeness of sin. Search all my thoughts, the secret springs, the motives that control, the chambers where polluted things hold empire over the soul. I pray this often and I, I cry. Lord, search all my thoughts the secret springs, the motives that control. The chambers where polluted things, those rooms that are locked up, old empire over the soul, that whatever the provocation, whatever the temptation, that what spills over will be the glory of Jesus. That's the life that God calls us to. And goes on to say, search, Till thy fiery glance has cast its holy light through all, and I by grace and brought at last before thy face to fall. Thus prostrate I shall learn of thee what now I feebly prove, that God alone in Christ can be unutterable love. That is my prayer, my brothers and sisters, for myself. That's what I want to share. This has been the burden of my heart. And this is what is God's call to all of us, to his church in these last days. Let the light of God shine into our hearts to give us the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you. You have sent your Holy Spirit right from the beginning to move upon the darkness there was in this world the devil created, that the devil brought and to, to move upon our lives. Not a one-time thing, but that he will continue to move, dear Lord Jesus, that you will have full control over every chamber where there were polluted things that held empire over our soul. Every cell in our lives and our minds, where there was darkness, where passion reigned, you'd quicken our conscience till it feels the loathsomeness of sin. Yes, Lord, we don't just say mere words, search all our thoughts, our secret springs, the motives that control many of our actions and words and why we say things and why we do things. And all those chambers 
which held empire over our souls. Lord Jesus, we want to throw open those doors, those windows, throw open it so that you can say, let there be light. The glory of God can come into our lives, Lord Jesus, and into your church as you bring to completion what you began, Lord, and finish in our lives what you began. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're perfect, that which concerns us. Bless the word, Lord, I have so feebly tried to share with what you want to do in our lives, Lord Jesus. Bless it. May the Holy Spirit awaken our hearts in these days that we will be all that you want us to be on this earth, Lord Jesus. That people will see Jesus in us. The fragrance will come from our lives. First of all, in our homes. And the stink and the smell will go. The fragrance will come. The fragrance of Christ as we allow you to triumph over us in every situation. We yield our lives to you. Bless this camp, Lord. Bless the word that comes to us in these days. Glorify your name, Lord Jesus. For your name's sake, we ask. Amen.